risen. He is risen Praise the Lord. It is Sunday morning. It is Resurrection Sunday. It's really funny. The first time I actually heard the he is risen, he is risen indeed, is when me and my wife were dating. Like we're dating. It's the first Easter, first time meeting her parents. I come, like think the second time meeting her parents. I come to the door. My now mother-in-law looks over and says, he is risen. And I'm like, what? Yes, he has. <laughs> yes, he has. And I'm like, I, what's funny? I met Jesus in an independent fundamentalist Baptist church. They did, we didn't do that there. That, that was completely new. And I'm like, yo, it's funny when I, I was in InterVarsity when I was in my undergrad and I told my staff worker, Deb, this, I'm like, yeah, Deb, this is what happened that weekend. She goes, oh my gosh, the same thing happened to me. Except I didn't say, yes, he has. She goes, that's the fact, Jack, was how I <laughs> responded to that. And I'm like, that is so much better. We need that. I'm like, but he is risen. And so we have a lot to do today in our text. We have two main texts we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 11 and then John 20. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pray. We're going to get into this. We're going to say a few things about Jesus. Then we're going to get in the text. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the resurrection. Lord, Good Friday is somber and we celebrate your death. And Lord, we end on a low note on Good Friday where, where they put you in the, where they crucified you, Lord, and they put you in the tomb. But Lord, you did not stay dead. Lord, we celebrate your resurrection. That, Lord, we have hope that the resurrection, Lord, Lord, that you lived the life we could not lead and died the death we deserve to die. And Lord, you're risen, you're reigning victorious. Lord, I pray that as we look at the text, our eyes, for those of us that don't believe, Lord, that our eyes would, their eyes would be opened. Lord, for those of us that do believe, that our eyes would be fixed on Jesus. And Lord, we would have hope in this resurrection. It's in your good name, amen. So today... I'm clearly from the sign behind me. We are studying the resurrection of Jesus on the resurrection Sunday. So in some sense, friends, brothers and sisters, that we, we remember this resurrection weekly. Like in some sense, this is a normal thing, right? We come into church, we talk about the resurrection of Jesus on a weekly basis. This is the same dog and pony show that we have week in and week out. We preach the risen savior who died in our place and for our sins. In some ways, brothers and sisters, this is special. This is special because we're focusing directly on this resurrection, which gives us hope. It shows the glory of God, gives us hope and hope of eternal life. Amen? So this is special, but in some sense, it's ordinary. Now today, a few billion people will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. They will sing praises to Jesus. We will preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus. We will worship Jesus for who he is and what he has done. I said this on our Good Friday service. Jesus is the most single, most famous person in all of history. There's more than anyone in history, more art honoring him, more music about him, more pages written in history about Jesus. History itself is broken into two because of the life of this man, Jesus Christ. It is BC before Christ, Ado Domini, in the year of our Lord. History itself is broken in two. I don't care what the secular guys tell you. There's no BC, BCE. No, it's it's BC, Ado Domini. It's in the year of our Lord. Now, of the calendar and of history, the two biggest holidays that we celebrate in the Christian faith and still within the Western world are Christmas, where we celebrate his birth. We celebrate the incarnation of Jesus, that God, the God man came, that God became man to live the life we couldn't lead, die the death we deserve to die in our place and for our sins. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. And then around this time of the year, we celebrate uh, resurrection, Easter. That This is actually, by the way, my favorite time of the year. I like this more than Christmas. And here's why. 
This is the mission that Jesus came on. Jesus came not to just to live, but to die in our place as a substitute. That we celebrate this time of year, like on Good Friday, we celebrate his death and his humiliation. And then on Sunday, like today, on Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate his exaltation, his resurrection. And then one day, brothers and sisters, we'll celebrate him coming again. We'll celebrate him coming again to judge the living and the dead. And we're going to love those of us that have trusted in him. We're going to love that. Amen. It's going to be glorious. It is going to be glorious. Now, just like every other famous person, right? Jesus is the most famous person in all of history. Just like every other famous person on the face of the planet, people have differing opinions about this man named Jesus. They have different opinions about his message. They have different opinions about, the, opinions about everything, right? People have different opinions about tomatoes and things like that too. I mean, people have opinions about everything. Now, I would say this too. Believe it or not, a lot of people in our culture and in the world would say that they love and admire Jesus and his gospel. Now, I would argue this for two points. I would argue this is why because of two points. One, most people know nothing about the Bible's description of Jesus and the gospel. They love a Jesus of their own imagination. And two, because Jesus is famous, they simply want to hijack his fame and use it as a springboard for their other agenda. Much like a celebrity endorsement, right? You ever see products and stuff like that, like toothpaste or shampoo or whatever? They're like, hey, buy this. This person uses this. People do that to the message of Jesus. And it's wrong, brothers and sisters. I've seen this, uh, I've seen this politically. I've seen this politically, like liberals would say, Jesus was a good moral teacher who taught people to be nice to each other and to be inclusive to all people, right? They would use Jesus to say, you should, ex you should be loving and within love, you should accept a sinful lifestyle, you should accept things that are against the Bible in the name of love and tolerance and acceptance, right? Conservatives sometimes do the same thing. We put guns, Jesus, and the American flag. I like all those things, but not, I mean, Jesus I love more than anything, right? Marxists would do the same thing. They would say, Jesus taught that we should give to the poor and redistribute wealth and stuff like that. No, no, he didn't. They would use Jesus to, to help redistribute things. Now, this, friends, happens, so this happens in the political spectrum. This happens even in the religious spectrum. Other religions, other aberrant heresies, try, they think Jesus is so famous, they try to tack on to it, which is crazy to me. Uh, Islam does this. They would say Jesus was a prophet pointing to Allah. And they would misuse Jesus and say, you should convert to Islam because Jesus was, Jesus was pointing to Allah. No, he wasn't. That's not what the scriptures say. Mormons would do, aberrant forms of Christianity do this. Like Mormons would say, well, Jesus, Jesus is really the brother of Lucifer, right? So he's the brother of Lucifer, the son of Elohim, among a pantheon of gods. No, no, they would, they would misuse Jesus in this way. Here's the thing that we're gonna be looking at today. Major thing with all of these opinions, right? Everyone's got an opinion on everything. We could, we could take a poll here and be like, we could pick tomatoes, for example. Like, do you like tomatoes? Do you not like tomatoes? Do you, do you like cucumbers? Do you not like cucumbers? Yes, I've watched a lot of Veggie Tales with my kids. So, <laughs> which is where the cucumbers and the veggies come from. People have opinions about everything. But you know what? It doesn't matter what our opinions are. It does not matter what our opinions are. All of these opinions about Jesus leave out one very important thing. They leave out scripture. They leave out scripture. Scripture, i.e. the Bible, this book, 66 books, is how we know about Jesus. Scripture is the epistemology of Christianity. Epistemology is a big five, 10, $20 word for how you know what you know. What we know about Jesus gets boiled down to what we know in the Bible. Around here, we believe in something called sola scriptura, right? Scripture is the highest court of authority. That if we have a problem back and forth, we have a question about anything, where can we go? Right to the scriptures. 
I mean, Bible's in our middle name, Berean Bible Church. Now, there's a famous quote by Spurgeon, which I absolutely love. It said, the word of God is the anvil upon which the opinions of men are smashed. Whatever our opinion is about Jesus today, whatever your opinion was, if you're visiting about Jesus, let's take everyone's opinion and smash them on scripture and let scripture be our guide. Now, we have two questions in our time together. In our time together, we have two questions I want to look at. I want to look at two different passages of the scripture to point, point this out. One, what does the scripture say about Jesus and the resurrection? And then what are we going to do about it? Because this is the, bi the biggest question brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors. The biggest question of your life is not where you will live. The biggest question is not who you will marry. The biggest question is not what you will do for a living. The biggest question is what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? And what does the scriptures say? Now, let's look at our text in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. This is Paul on the resurrection. Now, I love this text. I love working this text into uh, sermons. Those of you that have been around for me being the pastor here know that he, he loves this text. This is his text. This is one of them. I, I mean, I love all the text in the Bible. I mean, people say, what's your favorite verse? All of them, because I, I love them. I mean, God wrote them. But the reason why I love this, this is the clearest presentation of the gospel, of the good news that the apostle Paul preached. Now, let's read our text. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, last of all, to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Now, for those of you that don't know anything about the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was one of the most unlikely converts to Christianity ever. He persecuted the church of God. Paul actually went by another name before he met Jesus named Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jew of the Jews. He was not JV Jewish. He was varsity Jewish. He had the letter jacket and everything. It was cool. No, he really didn't. <laughs> Joke. Point is, Paul was so zealous for Judaism, he went and persecuted Christians. Like, like the first martyr of the church, Stephen, as they're stoning him to death, he's holding their coats. He's like, yep, go get him. And instead of, instead of breaking him to see that someone died, that only emboldens him. That emboldens him to, to go per, get a letter and go persecute the church. Well, Jesus meets this man on the road to Damascus and, you know, slaps him blind and converts him personally against his own free will, you know. And then Jesus, and then Jesus restores his sight and makes him an apostle. Uh, someone who is sent with the gospel. Now, I want to ask a few things here about the message of the gospel that Paul preached here. What is the gospel and the message of Jesus? Well, let's look about the gospel first. Paul says here, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. 
if you hold fast to the word that I, that I preached unless you believed in vain. Verse three, for I delivered to you as of first importance. The gospel was delivered as of first importance. The most important thing about Christianity is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The gospel message of Christ living a perfect life, that Christ was God living a perfect life in our place and for our sins, and then dying a brutal death in our place and for our sins is the cornerstone message. It is the first importance. It is like the spokes on a wheel. You guys ever read? I had a bike when I was a kid. I should probably ride one currently to, you know, lose some LBs. But the, the center on the spokes, the center, the hub that the wheel is attached to and everything else coming out of it, that's the gospel. The gospel is of first importance. So if you forget everything I say today, Remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news. It is good news to the hearers because it gives us eternal life. Another thing about this gospel, I delivered to the first importance what I also received. Paul didn't make this up. This isn't just some figment of this man's imagination. He really met Jesus on the road to Damascus, really was converted. This is something that's, that's not just, hey, we're making a cool story. This isn't like the Easter bunny that shows up and gives eggs. This is not a myth. This is real. This is something that, not something that we made up in a figment of our imagination, but this is the truth of the gospel. Now, this is also a historical event. He says here, he appeared to Peter and to the 12 and over 500 brothers, which are still alive. This is not just a, like I said, this is not just a story about something Jesus did, but this is actually historical, verifiable, bona fide fact. This is a real event. This wasn't just something that happened like a story or like George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. This isn't just some apocryphal story. This is historical fact that the people in the New Testament verified. 500 brothers and sisters that Jesus appeared to. He appeared to the 12 and Paul says he appeared to me on the road to Damascus. This is real. This is is historical fact. We actually have, believe it or not, non-Christians writing about the gospel message of Jesus Christ in the first century. You guys have heard of a man named Josephus. Josephus wrote of these Christians. The Christian actually was a derogatory name when we first got it. Like we wear it like a badge of honor, like I'm a Christian. But it actually was a derogatory thing in the first New Testament. It was like little Christ. Like you're a little Christ. And we just were like, yes, we are. Now, this is a real historical event. Josephus wrote about this in many of his works that people were worshiping this dude, Jesus, who rose from the dead. This is a historical fact. Now, the content of this gospel that we see here with Paul Jesus died for our sins and died according to the scriptures. We see this here. For I delivered to you as a first importance, that also which I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. I want to break this into two things. Why did he need to die? Maybe you're sitting here and you're not familiar with Christianity. Why did he need to die? Well, for our sins. This is an important question. When we ask about what is sin? Am I sinful? This is a really important question. Do you know why? All of us are sinful. Everyone within the sound of my voice, whether you're watching online, whether you're in this room, whether it's 30 years from now and someone has found this on the internet somewhere, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. And here's the thing. If we don't fully understand our depravity, we don't fully understand our need for the gospel, we're not going to cling to the gospel, right? For example, this is the reason why I preach sin as hard as I do. Because like if I was coming to you and I said, hey, uh, Jose, you have, a, you have an illness right here. Jose, you are really sick. And Jose feels fine. 
Jose is not, I'm not coughing. I've got no stuffy head. It's not, I'm not achy. I don't need NyQuil. I don't need any of these things. I said, listen, you got a real bad problem. I got this, I got this medicine right here. I need you to drink this. It's going to be bitter going down, but it'll make you feel way better. If he doesn't understand his sickness, he doesn't understand his need for this medicine, guess what's going to happen? He's going to reject it. He's going to reject the, mess, the, the, the medicine, which is life-saving. The reason why I proclaim sin and the reason why we unpack this and ask the question, why do we need the gospel? Because we're sinners. We need the medicine of the gospel to give us eternal life. Amen? Amen. Now, we are sinful. The reason why we need the gospel is we're sinful. The condition of humanity is is by nature under wrath. We are sinners by nature and by choice. I'll unpack both those. We are sinners by nature. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the garden, sinned against a holy, righteous, glorious God by being disobedient to him. They ate of the knowledge of the, of the ate of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. And they, they, have a, they had sin nature. Everything broke in that. Everything broken, all of creation. And they passed this sin nature onto their offspring. They passed this sin nature onto you, onto me. And the whole rest of the world broke. And you know what? You know in your heart of hearts that this is true. You know that something is broken within this world because even when you watch the news and you see something going, you see horrible travesties, horrible natural, natural disasters, or you see people that don't get justice, or you see murderers, rapists, whatever. You see those things, you're like, that's wrong. That's a problem. That thing that wells up inside of you, you know something is broken within this world. You know sin exists out there. I use this analogy all the time. You locked your car before you came in here. You know why? Because you don't want someone rummaging through your stuff. You locked your door last night before you went to sleep. You know why? Because you know there's problems in the world. And you know what? Here's the thing. Sin is not, this sin problem is not just out there. That sin problem is also in here. It is also in there. It is in your heart as well. It is not just a problem outside of us that needs to be fixed, but a problem inside of us that needs to be atoned for. We need a new heart, new nature. This is the reason why we're sinners by choice as well. All of us stand justly condemned before holy, righteous God. Romans 3.10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we took a spiritual EKG, right? You know the thing, a spiritual sonogram of your heart, you know what would be written all over it? Sin. Sin. I know some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm a good person. I'm not sinful. I'm not Adolf Hitler. I'm not evil. Have you kept, friend, have you kept the Ten Commandments? Have you kept the Ten Commandments? We don't need a show of hands. There's not going to be a pop quiz. There's no cards underneath your chair for us to take this test. But I'm just going to ask the question. Have you kept the Ten? Let's just think if you're righteous, let's just see if you hold up just the Ten. There's 600, over 600 laws in the Old Testament that we've broken. Let's just say the 10. Let's just take three of the 10. Have you ever told a lie? We're not raising hands, but just think. Have you ever told a lie? I have. Have you ever stolen something, even if it was small? Maybe the pen at the bank that they chained down for people like me that pens disappear randomly. They're, they chain them down. I mean, I take them off sometimes and pop them in here accidentally, of course, because I mean, it's like a pen clip though. It's like a, there, there should be a support group. Have you ever looked at someone lustfully? Jesus says, if you looked at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. Now, if God was going to hold you accountable on the day of judgment, I want you to think about this. 
someone's a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart, would God hold you innocent or would God hold you guilty? Guilty. Guilty. The gavel would fall guilty. That's the, that's the answer. Well, here's the bad news. There's a punishment for sin. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The wages of sin is death. We're all justly standing before a holy, righteous God. And this is the reason why I try to warn people week in and week out, judgment is coming. Flee from the wrath of God. Judgment is coming. Flee to Christ. The Old Testament, the other phrase in here, in accordance with the scriptures, which we see twice. The, the first mention of the gospel, actually when our, when our first parents sinned and are standing before God, God gives them something that theologians like to call the proto-evangelion, which is, he says to the serpent, he, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. He will, he will crush his head and he will bruise his heel. This is pointing already in the garden to the Lord Jesus Christ who would do these things in our place and for our sins. This is the greatest thing within the, the whole Old Testament, by the way, points to Jesus. All the sacrifices, it's like a bloodbath back there, by the way. Like there's a sacrifice for this or two turtle doves or a lamb and all the other stuff. It's like a bloodbath. Do you know why? It's pointing to the severity of our sin. The point, the need of a savior, a need of a perfect sacrifice. Every one of those sacrifices in the Old Testament functioned like an interest payment on a credit card. I don't know if you've ever had one of these things, but if you just pay the interest off, you'll be dead before you pay it off. The sacrifices in the Old Testament were just to temporarily cover sin. The once for all sacrifice of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords covers the sin permanently died in accordance with the scriptures. Now I want to say this thing about the resurrection. Look with me in verse 13 and 18, which is massively, massively important. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead and not even Christ is risen from the dead, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he, didn't, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Look at verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised and your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we only if in Christ we have hope in this life only we are all the people to be pitied. Now, with the resurrection, all of the res all the promises and glorious things about Christianity hinge on this resurrection. They hinge on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus is just dead in a hole somewhere, like if the if Good Friday is all there is where Jesus is brutalized uh lied about, humiliated, killed, and thrown in a hole, that's not good news. That might be a good example, but not good news. Paul says that here, that if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, it's like our preaching is in vain. We are wasting our time. If Jesus isn't alive, we are wasting our time doing this right here. I am wasting my breath if Christ is not alive. Although brothers and sisters, he is alive. Our faith is in vain. Like all other world religions that don't have, a, that don't have, they have good teachers, but no crucified, resurrected saviors. Buddha did not rise from the grave. Buddha said at the end of his life, he was just a man. Same thing with Muhammad. He's just a man. Christ is God, God risen. Now, the other thing, we are still in our sins. This is the worst part about this. If Christ isn't raised from the grave, we're still in our sins. There's still sacrifice that needs to be made. This is horrible. We need a, we need a crucified, risen Savior to cleanse us from our own guilt before a holy, righteous God and let us live a, a spirit-filled, cleansed life. Amen? Uh, Brother Steve said earlier this morning when, when he was praying that our loved ones, that we, our loved ones that have gone, that we, 
glory in the fact that when our loved ones pass away, they're in Christ, that they're with Jesus. If Christ isn't raised from the dead, there's no hope for grandma. There's no hope for grandpa. There's no hope for mom or for dad or for whoever if they're not in Christ, if, they're, if Christ isn't raised from the dead. Christians, historic, Christians at funerals, we grieve differently. We grieve differently because of the resurrection. We grieve differently because of the gospel because we don't just see someone laying in a box. We don't just see a dead body like, well, when you're done, you're done, you're dead, you're dead, okay. No, that person that's dead in Christ is more alive. They're more alive than they've ever been. The things taste better and they're more, they're in the presence of their savior. They, heaven is glorious, not because our dead, by the way, heaven is glorious, not because our dead loved ones are there, but because Jesus is there. Amen. So it takes away the thing that helps us grieve. And Paul says here, we are to be pitied. If we only have Christ in this life, we are to be pitied. You know why you pity people like that? Because they're believing a lie. You pity people that believe lies. I see people that go to faith healers or I watch this um, man on the moon with uh, Jim Carrey talking about Andy Kaufman and stuff like that. And one of the things toward the end of his life, he went to uh, a faith healer in the movie and the guy like sur- psycho surgical things, they broke an egg and there was some bacon on there. Oh, this is your tumor or whatever. And he knew it was a scam. He knew it was a scam in the movie. He's like, oh man, I seen the guy just like sleight of hand tricks. You're not getting healed. People that go to faith healers like that, they don't get healed. That's not, that's not how that works. God does heal in miraculous ways, but that's not how he does it through charlatans and shysters. There's a quote by, famous quote by C.S. Lewis. The only thing Christianity cannot be is mildly important. Either Christianity is not important at all, or it's the most important thing ever, ever. Do you know why? because our very souls and our lives depend on it. Now, and I know we don't have a ton of time left, but in the time that we do have, I want to just look at the resurrection and the story of Jesus and just walk through the text of John 20 in our time together. John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and while it was dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, and the one whom Jesus loved, and they said to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And they stooped, and they stooped, Uh, stopped to look in and he saw the linen cloths laying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came and followed him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the faith's cloth, which had been on Jesus, Jesus head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in the place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as of yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciple, disciples went back to their houses. Now, what's happening in this text? This is the reason why I want to look at the resurrection of Jesus and say, what is going on in this text? Because everything hinges on the resurrection in Christianity. So Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and to anoint the body of Jesus early in the morning, it's actually kind of providential. I had this in my sermon and then uh, Timothy came up and said, hey, I want to read this text in Matthew about this. If you were paying attention, you noticed something about the two texts. They're different. They're different for a reason, right? There's this thing we have in the gospels where things are slightly different and this is a good thing. There's something within scripture, right? Scripture never contradicts itself, amen? Now, when you have eyewitness testimony, you have things that go on where people tell stories just slightly differently. And there's a reason for this. This is called redaction. So when John is telling the story of 
Mary Magdalene going to the tomb, well, in the Matthew version, there is other women there. It's not that John doesn't know that there's other women there. It's the fact that they're not the ones that ran and told the disciples. They weren't the one talking, right? So eyewitness testimony, this is actually a good thing when instead of everything just being buttoned up all the same, like we know that this is more, this is accurate, right? There's a thing within the gospels called harmony. Harmony. It's just like musical notes on, a, on an instrument, right? Like you play three notes and it forms a chord. It gives you a fuller picture as to what's going on, right? Does that make sense? Now we see here Mary finds the body missing. She runs back to Peter and, Peter and John and both Peter and John run back to the tomb. John beats Peter in the foot race Love this, by the way. Mentioned this several times. Imagine Peter and John just sitting there like, man, I beat you. No one's going to know. It's just us. And the, the, the ladies are back there. Everyone. Well, you see just John looking over. Everyone's going to know because I'm going to tell them. That's hilarious. <laughs> Peter's just probably like, he's younger than me. Come on. I'm just, this was probably like two miles, by the way. This was probably like oh, around a mile. Like you run a mile, run back. I'm going to be winded. Like, I'm going to be winded at the parking lot. I'm just saying. I'm like, oh, yeah. So they stop at the tomb. John is running. He beats Peter, stops at the tomb. You guys ever wonder why he stopped at the tomb? I was thinking, I'm weird, right? So I read the scriptures and I love the Bible. And I'm sitting here. I'm like, why would John stop? I wouldn't stop. I just keep going. I'm like Peter. I just Peter's my, like my guy. Like he opens his mouth, sticks his foot in. That's me. I love Peter for a reason. Like John's more like calculated. Well, I was reading a commentator this week and he pointed me to Numbers 1916 through, uh, yeah, Numbers 1914 through 16. It says this, this is the law. When someone dies in a tent, everyone who comes in the tent or everyone who is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel that is not covered, fastened on it, it is unclean. Whoever is in an open field and touches someone who, is, who was killed with a sword, who has died naturally, or touches a human bone or a grave shall be unclean seven days. The Old Testament law had laws about touching corpses. So John is booking it. He's just moving and then stops. This might be why he stopped. He stopped right before the tomb because he's like, well, wait a minute, there's, there's a corpse in there. There's, there's a body. So he stops. Peter charges in, which I think is absolutely wonderful within character for Peter, sees the grave clothing sitting neatly folded, right? He sees the grave clothing neatly folded in this, in this text. And this is massively significant. Do you know why this is very significant? It proves the body wasn't stolen. It proves the body wasn't stolen. It further proves and gives credence to the resurrection, right? Because there's two reasons. One, Jesus was poor. Let me just be honest. Jesus was God in the flesh and poor. He had women that took care of his ministry. And the most expensive thing in that tomb, right? Jesus was poor, laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, rich guy's tomb. Jesus couldn't afford one himself, the most expensive thing in that tomb was not the body of Jesus, but the spices he was wrapped up in. So grave robbers during those times would steal bodies and take those spices off, just like shady funeral directors. Like I steal, they steal the caskets and just throw the, the body back in there. They were trying to, they would just take the whole thing, right? They would have just taken the whole thing, but they left the most expensive stuff there. Huh. Very, very awesome. Also, the grave robbers would have just taken the whole, they wouldn't have taken the time to disrobe the body. Because we have to ask the question, what happened to the body? Because if people that don't believe the resurrection, you have to ask, well, what, what happened to the body of Jesus? All the disciples, right? Here's the other thing that further proves the resurrection. All the, like 11 out of the original 12 disciples or 10 out of the original 12 disciples were martyred. Right? The only one that doesn't get martyred is John. Well, he's exiled to Patmos and like deep fried in oil, right? Kind of like a French fry. Just, <laughs> bad analogy, sorry. Um, but he gets boiled in oil and exiled to Patmos and then dies in Ephesus. 
Well, Judas hangs himself. Peter gets crucified upside down. These men didn't die for a lie. These men, even doubting Thomas, later on in our text, we see Thomas, Jesus says, put your fingers in the wounds of the, the crucifixion scars. Even doubting Thomas was impaled on a pike for the cause of the gospel. And they died going to their graves, knowing what they knew about the resurrection because they had seen the risen Lord. But these grave robbers, if somebody took the body, no one would have took the time to strip it out. They would have just taken the whole thing because grave robbery was punishable by death, right? Especially if there's a centurion sitting there, which they posted right in front of the grave because Jesus said he was coming back. Now, we see another thing real quickly here in uh, John 20, verse, starting in verse 11 where Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus lay, one at his head and one at his feet. When they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She said to him, he said, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I've yet to I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to me. Now, as we see here, the disciples have been to the tomb, they've gone home, Mary probably running back, is sitting there weeping, looking for Jesus. Two angels ask her why she's weeping. She's clearly thinking like somebody's taken the body, right? She's clearly like trying to figure out where the body of Jesus is. Now, Jesus appears to her, right? Mind you, this has taken place in the early morning, right? It says here, it's before the sunrise, early morning. She sees some dude off in the distance, think he's the gardener, right? He's there to trim the hedges. He's here to like, he's like here to plant some flowers or whatever. He's like the seminary, a cemetery caretaker, right? And the first, this is very significant. This is very significant reason why I bring this up. If the disciples were going to give a fictitious account of the resurrection of Jesus, you know what they would not have done? They would not have had the first person to see the risen Lord to be a woman. There's a reason for this. We think, unfortunately, we think something called anachronistically. We think with 21st century mindsets and think in first century terms, right? That seems chauvinistic, bigoted, whatever. But they thought differently than we do, right? They just like 1950s, they thought differently than we do now. And then in the first century, they thought completely different than we do now. Now, this is significant because if John was going to fabricate a story of the resurrection, like if this was just going to be totally, like, we're making this up, they would not have picked Mary Magdalene to be the first person to see Jesus. They just would not have. This further gives credence to the biblical account that Jesus, that this story is accurate. Now, she thinks him to be the gardener and asks himself and asks him, where have you moved him? Where have you moved my Lord? Now, this is very interesting too. And because she's a woman, right? I'm not trying to be sexist or anything else like this, but women typically aren't as strong as men, right? I'm just saying, like, if we're having a contest between me and my wife and we're moving 50 pound bags of flour or 50 pound bags of feed or whatever, I'm probably gonna win that one. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm stocky. That's probably a good thing. But like, she's not gonna be able to move a several hundred pound body but she's willing. She's willing because she's diligently seeking Jesus. I heard one commentator when I was reading this say, she diligently sought Jesus. And even though she might not have been strong enough to move him, she was willing because she was seeking him. She sought Jesus with her whole heart. She sought the Lord with her whole heart. 
That should honestly, brothers and sisters, as we think of the resurrection, we should be seeking Jesus with our whole hearts. We should be seeking Jesus with everything that we have. Well, Jesus calls her by her name. He says, Mary. And then she realizes that it's Jesus, right? She calls him Rabboni, teacher. And then she, commentators say this when he says, don't touch me, don't, t- uh, don't cling to me for I've not ascended to my father. The customary greeting as we've seen, the customary thing as we've seen in uh, Matthew's gospel account when Timothy read this was she probably was on her knees grabbing him like a child would. You ever had that with little kids where they grab onto your leg and you got to peel them off? I have that all the time when I come home from work. I come home, I'm like, kids, and they greet me. And I usually get Caleb on this end and Chrissy or JJ, and they're just like attached. It's like that. She had diligently sought her Lord and was now holding on to him for everything that she had. And Jesus tells her something very, 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 very interesting. Now, it's very interesting too with this her holding on to him because this proves something. Jesus physically rose from the dead. This wasn't a ghost. This wasn't in her mind. This wasn't her mental image. Like, oh, that's a ghost. No, it's not. It was the risen Lord. She probably, when she grabbed a hold of his legs, she probably could see the nail marks where they put the, the nails to his feet. When he lifted her up with his hands, she probably could see the crucifixion scars on his hands. This was the physical resurrection of Christ. Now, I want to say this. Jesus tells her to go tell his brothers that he has ascended, that he's ascending to their, his father and their father, his God and their God. This is important in the time that we have left. One of the best benefits of the gospel is being adopted. We are, when you repent of your sins, you turn away from your sins and you trust in Christ, you become adopted into the family of God. You get a new father, new brothers, new sisters, new everything. I know many people come from jacked up families, right? And one of the greatest healing things of the gospel is healing our families. We have brothers and sisters that speak different languages, have different skin colors, don't even, that we will meet one day and live in different time periods, that one day we will see them and it will be glorious as we're, dan- as we're praising our king around the throne. You can go into any country on the face of the planet where Christianity is and find brothers and sisters and family. It was the coolest experience, one of, my, one of the coolest experiences of my life in 2004 when I went on a mission trip to Mexico. I don't speak Spanish, I speak Spanglish, like, like I, freshman Spanish, that's all I got. And there was a little Mexican boy, I'm sitting down there, I'm like, Jesus es Salvador? He's like, see, sí, yes, yes, mi hermano, he's a, and he just, my brother, and he hugs me. I don't, like, it was one of the coolest experiences, he's five. He was like a five-year-old little kid. He's like, my brother, I don't look like him, we don't talk the same, we don't eat the same kind of foods, but guess what? We were in Christ. We were in Christ, and we were family. The gospel makes us family. Now, I said earlier that there was two questions. What does the scripture say and what are we gonna do about it? What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Repent and believe the gospel. Turn away from your sins. Trust fully in the finished work of Christ in your place and for your sins on your behalf. Jesus, or the, John, the apostle, says a few verses down in our text where he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, right? Not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Brother, sister, friend, flee to Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn away. Trust in Jesus. Let today be the day of salvation. This is a divine appointment. You are not sitting here in this room by accident. You are not listening to this sermon on wherever you're listening to by accident. Let today be the day that you turn away from your sin. Let today be the day that you trust in Christ. Get your sins forgiven, adopted in the family of God. Let this be what we do with Jesus. Let's pray brothers and sisters. 
Lord Jesus, you're glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection that we get to celebrate today. Lord, we thank you for the eternal life that you give us in your death, burial, and resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that we're family, we're made family in the gospel. Lord, that we have brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. We have a father and we have an elder brother who died in our place and for our sins. Lord, we thank you that you give us new life in this gospel. And Lord, we thank you that you're ruling and reigning currently. That you're not, you're not just risen, but you're ruling and reigning. And you're, you're, one day you're coming to judge the living and the dead. And it's our responsibility and our joy to herald this gospel throughout all places so that, people, so that you might draw your people to yourself. And Lord Jesus, we pray that if there's anyone here, man, woman, boy, girl, that wh whoever's listening, Lord, that if they don't know Christ, that today would be the day that they turn away, that they follow you as a Lord and a Savior. It's in your good name, Lord Jesus. Amen.